Hi, year 11. Uh, this is your multiple choice section of your paper from last week. So uh, question one was, uh, it could just be a recall question, but you could also do some thinking. Either just memorize for me that the area under a speed time graph is distance, or use the fact that you know the equation for uh, speed is distance divided by time. If you rearrange that, speed multiplied by time gives me distance. And I'm doing a height multiplied by a base um, to find area under a graph in this case. So I am doing a speed multiplied by a time, so I will get distance. So you just, this would be one that I would say is worth just memorizing as a fact, um, but you can also think about it logically as well. So in question two, the diagram shows a series of images of a moving object taken at regular intervals. Regular intervals <clears throat> means that there is the same time between each circle. Okay, so to go from here to here, there was the same time taken from here to here, same time taken from here to here, same time taken from here to here, same time taken, and so on. So to go from one circle to the next, the same amount of time has elapsed. So initially, the distance between the balls is the same. And so you're traveling the same distance in that same amount of time. Speed is distance over time. So if you're doing the same distance divided by the same time, the speed initially is constant. <clears throat> but then after a while, the distance that the ball travels in the same amount of time, remember that each ball uh, was photographed at the same time interval later, the distance is increasing. So clearly a higher distance is being traveled in the same amount of time, so you must be going at a higher speed. So to increase your speed, you have to accelerate, which gets me answer C. In question three, a light ball is held at rest at the top of a tall cliff. It is released and falls through the air, which tells us that air resistance exists in this question eventually reaching terminal velocity. Which row describes the behavior of the ball as it descends? So we know that when it's initially dropped, it hasn't actually fallen through any air yet. So initially there is no air resistance. The only force on the ball would be the weight at time is zero because weight always exists, um, but you have to be falling through air for air resistance to exist. So initially the weight causes the acceleration. And so therefore the acceleration is due to gravity only, it is G. But as it falls, obviously it starts to hit uh, air particles. Um, and so we know that the air resistance increases as the speed increases, that acts in the opposite direction. Eventually when we reach terminal velocity, the weight down equals the air resistance up, they cancel each other out. So effectively the resultant force is zero. If there's no overall force on an object, there is no acceleration. So the final value is zero. In <clears throat> question four, sorry, I chose a terrible highlighter for this video. The table shows the mass and volume of three different liquids, X, Y, and Z. So mass and volume, you should immediately be going, well, mass divided by volume is density. The question's going to be linked to that. Um, we have these liquids placed in the same container. They don't mix, so they um, layer on top of each other. We know that more dense objects sink and less dense objects float. So in order to know which one is at the top and the bottom, we need to know which one will sink and which one will float. We need to know their density values. So we calculate the density for each by doing the mass divided by the volume. So you've got those in the table. Um, and then you look for the smallest density, the lowest density will float. So that will be at the top. Um, so that gets me X at the top. And then the largest density will be the one that sinks, that will be at the bottom, so that gets me Y, so that gets me to A there. Question five was super straightforward, you just needed to remember the equation. Um, density is mass divided by volume, so in order to know the density, you need to know the mass and the volume. For question six, four objects each have two forces acting on them, which object is in equilibrium? So. The word equilibrium means that for the object that you're thinking about, the resultant force on it is zero and the resultant moment on it is zero. Honestly, this is also worth memorizing because in your paper four, it's worth two marks. 
um, as a definition. So if it asks you to define equilibrium, you're going to say resultant force is zero, one mark, resultant moment is zero, second mark. So for the force uh, overall on an object to be zero, the individual forces have to be equal and opposite. They cancel each other out. So obviously in A, we've got one newton pushing to the right, but we also have one newton pushing to the left. There's no resultant force in either direction. They cancel out. So resultant force is zero. We also know <clears throat> that these two forces are acting along the same line. So because they're acting opposite to each other and they cancel out, there's no turning effect either. This box won't spin. So the resultant moment, remember that the word moment means turning effect, will also be zero. So A is in equilibrium. Now for B, just so you're sure, the resultant force is, uh, is still zero. We've got one to the right, one to the left. They cancel out. So resultant force is zero. But because they act at a distance um, from the center of mass, it's going to cause the box to spin. So if you imagine this is the center point, um, if you apply a force top left and bottom right, that box is going to spin. So there is a turning effect. The resultant moment is not zero. It can't be B. In C and D, obviously, both forces act in the same direction. And so there is a resultant force. C will move to the right because of the 2 newton resultant and D will also move to the left because of the 2 newton resultant. <coughs> In question 7, a uniform beam, which, by the way, if it tells you uniform, it means that it's equally, the mass of the beam is equally distributed, which means that the centre of mass is in the centre um, and the weight force of the beam itself would act through the pivot, so that wouldn't provide a moment. So saying that the uniform be beam exists and the pivot is at the centre means that without um, anything placed on it, the beam would balance because the weight acts through that pivot point. So X and Y are identical. They are placed so that the beam balances. We know that their weight, the force um, that is exerted because of their mass, will act vertically down. Okay, So X provides an anti-clockwise moment because it's going to twist this beam this way. Y provides a clockwise moment because it's going to twist around this way, but they are equal and opposite because we would do this force multiplied by this distance equals this force multiplied by this distance. So then it says, but we've now added a smaller mass on the left-hand side. So we know that that's going to cause this whole thing to tip. In order to get the beam to balance again, we need to remove the moment that is provided by this small mass. So what we need to do is we know that moment is force times perpendicular distance. We can't get rid of the force that it exerts on the beam, but what we can do is we can move it so that it sits at the pivot point so that the perpendicular distance is zero, so that when you do this sum, you get zero. And if you have zero moment, you have zero turning effect, so it won't make it twist. So what we need to do is get the small mass to the pivot. So um, we need to overall shift some of the mass that we have on this side towards the pivot to reduce that anti-clockwise moment that we've just produced. And the only option for that is moving x towards the pivot. Okay. In question eight... <clears throat> a ball of mass M falls vertically and hits a hard surface. Its speed on hitting the surface is V1. It rebounds vertically upwards with a speed V2. Now, this is key. Speed just means how fast. Velocity means how fast and in which direction. When you're looking at momentum, it's a vector. So we have to look at velocity and not speed. So our calculations have to include the direction. What that means is if we say that moving upwards is positive, moving downwards would be negative. Okay, And so initially the speed is V1, but it means the velocity is minus V1. It rebounds upwards with V2. That's a positive. So we now have minus v1 to begin with, 
V2 afterwards. Change in momentum. So momentum is mass times velocity. So we need the final momentum, MV, minus the initial momentum to get the change. And I've just uh, factorized to get MV take U. V is the final velocity, which we can see it after it has rebounded, it has V2. So I'm replacing V with V2. I have to minus the initial velocity. So I minus minus V1. Okay, this is where the minus sign is very important. When you minus a minus, it becomes a plus, so we end up with C. In question nine, a resultant force accelerates a car of mass M along a straight horizontal road from rest. Rest means not moving. If it's not moving, initially it doesn't have any momentum. It has a speed V after time T, giving it momentum P. Which pair of relationships for this situation is correct? Okay, well, the first thing is momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. So we can immediately get rid of D and A. And then we need to decide whether B or C are correct. And this is where you have to remember that impulse, which is change in momentum, is also equal to force multiplied by time. Um, so you really just have to remember that in order to be able to get this right. And the reason why we can say it's equal to P and not delta P is because the change in momentum is the final minus the initial and the initial momentum was zero. So the change is that uh, final value. So it is equal to P. So that gets me to C. Um, question 10. So this is using your energy transfer. A stone is dropped from a tall tower and falls a distance of 50 metres to the ground. So initially it has gravitational potential energy. Obviously as it falls, it loses height, so it loses gravitational potential energy. Energy isn't destroyed, it's just transferred to a different type. So the gravitational potential energy becomes kinetic energy. So whatever it loses, <clears throat> so the change in GPE it gains as kinetic energy. So those changes are equal. So mg delta h is my change in gravitational potential energy, right? So this bit here is mg h1 uh, minus mg h2. That's what I've done by doing mg delta h, okay? That has to be equal to the kinetic energy gained, so a half mv squared. There are m's on both sides of this equation, so I cancel those. I want to get v by itself, so I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 2. So I get 2gh is v squared, and then I just need to square root that to get to v. And then I have the values from the question. 2 is just 2. g is 9.8, you need to know that. And then the height change was 50 metres, and that gets you, when you plug it into your calculator, 31 metres per second. In question 11, the diagram shows part of a roller coaster ride uh, with cars at different positions. It moves from X to Y. What happens to the energy in the kinetic store and the gravitational potential store of the car as it moves from X to Y? Well, from X to Y, the height of the car clearly decreases, right? Its position above the ground decreases. So therefore, the gravitational potential energy has to decrease. It has to transfer that energy somewhere, and it does that to kinetic energy, plus a little bit of sound and heat, but we know that the kinetic energy will increase, right? You speed up as you go down. You can also just use your life knowledge here. So your kinetic energy is your energy associated with moving objects. It moves more by the time it's at Y than it does X, so Ke increases. In question 12, an object of mass M falls from a higher shelf to a lower shelf. Uh, how much gravitational potential energy does the object lose? So again, initially, GPE is MGH, where H is H1. After it falls, it's MGH2. The difference is the loss of gravitational potential energy. So I'm doing MGH1 minus MGH2. I'm just factorizing and I end up with D. In question 13, this takes a little bit of thinking. A woman of mass 50 kilograms has 81 joules of kinetic energy. What is her speed? So notice that I 
do this a lot. So I annotate letters within the question so I can immediately pull things for myself later quickly. So what is her speed linked to kinetic energy? I start with the kinetic energy equation, but I rearrange it for what I'm looking for. So I want V by itself. So to get rid of the half, I have to multiply both sides by two. To get rid of the M, I have to divide both sides by M. So I end up with 2KE over M equals V squared. To get V, I then square root. So I've got the square root of 2KE over M. Um, and then I plug the numbers in that I know because I'm told KE, I'm told M. And that gets me to 1.8. <coughs> Excuse me. This next one really is just one that you just need to memorize. The equation P is rho G H or delta P is rho G delta H can be used for a liquid. So the pressure is equal to the density of the liquid multiplied by G multiplied by the height difference uh, of the liquid. Uh, so the height causing that amount of pressure on an object within the liquid. Um, so what we just need to do here is literally just memorize that the rho value here is the density of the liquid. In question 15, a measuring cylinder of cross-sectional area, that's A, contains 224 centimetres cubed, that's V, the volume of a liquid. From maths, I know that the volume of a cylinder is equal to the cross-sectional area multiplied by my height. So I know that V equals AH or H equals V divided by A. So I can find the height of my liquid by doing the volume divided by the area. When I do that, I get that in centimetres because I had centimetres cubed and centimetres squared. Okay, I have to convert that into metres because if you look at the units, it's kilograms per metre cubed, not per centimetre cubed. So my H value in my equation needs to be in meters. So then once I've got that value, I take my pressure equation, P is rho G H, and I've literally just given this to you here to help you out. You rearrange for rho, the density, it's P divided by G H. We are told that the pressure was 8,800 when the height was this value of 0.56. G is always 9.8, so when you plug this in uh, to your equation, you get 1,603, which rounds to 1,600 for C. Quite a lot of steps there for one mark. In question 16, which colours of visible light are in the correct order of increasing wavelength? Uh, so you just need to remember the order of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. But you also need to remember that the longest wavelength is red and the shortest wavelength is violet and then you need to just choose the correct one um, from smallest to biggest wavelength and that is C. In question 17 the frequency of the microwaves uh, was 2400 megahertz. Mega is times a million so 2400 times a million which is times 10 to the 6. That has to be right to get the correct answer. So then we say, okay, what is the wavelength? I have wave speed as frequency multiplied by wavelength, V equals F lambda. I know that it's a microwave, so it's in the EM spectrum, so I know that it's the speed of light in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Rearrange for wavelength, wave speed divided by frequency, and when I plug the correct numbers in, I get to 0 0.125 meters. In question 18, again, you just needed to remember this. So which row gives approximate values for speed of sound in copper, water and air? Well, copper is a metal. You should know that it's solid. Water is a liquid. Air is a gas. You should remember that sound travels fastest in a solid because the particles are closest together there and sound travels from collisions, remember? And so the closer the particles are to begin with, the easier it's going to be to collide and knock on with the next one. So it's gonna be, you need the fastest value to be in copper and the slowest value to be in air. Plus I told you to memorize these rough numbers as well. So that gets you to A. For number 19, I'm actually just gonna zoom out a little bit because I had to fit it in at the bottom. Sorry, I should have given you a bit more room. A ship sounds its horn when it is 790 meters from a cliff. 
A passenger on the ship hears the echo 4.8 seconds later. What is the speed of sound? So you have to remember for an echo that the sound has to travel there and back. So the total distance is two lots of the 790. You're told the time. And then once you've got that, you just use speed as distance over time, getting you to 329 meters per second, um, getting you 330 meters per second in this particular case. Remember I said a rough idea is 340, but that it fluctuates based on temperature, um, based on height. So you can't just assume it's going to be C. In number 20, they've kind of added more rays to distract you, but as long as you focus on the wording in the question, you should be okay. So a thin converging lens in a camera produces a real image on a photosensitive surface as shown. Which, uh, at which position is the image of the top of the object formed? So immediately look for the top. And so you should only be looking at the two rays that come from the top. Um, and you should just ignore the ones that come from the bottom. So I know that the one coming in from the top that is parallel to the principal axis will come out through the focal point. So the focal point must be here. Okay. I know that one that goes through the center of the lens carries on. And so those two rays meet here. This is where the image will be formed. Okay. So remember that this is essentially where you're going to see the, the top of the object. So if you remember we had a candle and the flame was up, when we looked through on the screen, the flame pointed down. So this was the base of the candle, so the metal dish. So this is where you would see the metal dish. Okay, but this is the top of the image here. <clears throat> okay, so in section two, your written questions, um, you can see you've got two children, balanced on a seesaw. Uh, they have different weights and they are at different distances from the pivot. So the pivot is the point at which this thing turns around. So we know that if the child B sits on this side, it's going to tend to turn the seesaw this way, provides a clockwise moment. Whereas child A is pushing down on the left, it's going to tend to cause this thing to tip in an anti-clockwise way. So it provides an anti-clockwise moment. Child B moves 0.05 meters further away from the pivot. This will catch you out. You need to then change this number. It's now 0.85 meters, so they've shifted ever so slightly. Explain why the seesaw rotates clockwise. So what has happened is this force of 900 newtons is now acting five centimeters further away from the pivot than it did before. And I know that the moment, which we've said earlier, is the turning effect, is calculated by the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the pivot. So we know that the perpendicular distance to the pivot is the one that is at right angles to it, right? So the pivot is at this position. The perpendicular distance that makes a right angle is this distance. And what we've just said is the force hasn't changed because the child is the same, but the distance that they are from that pivot is now further back. So when you do that calculation, the moment, the turning effect, will increase. So what you want to say is child B's clockwise moment increases because they have moved further from the pivot. Whereas child A's anti-clockwise moment, their turning effect, has not changed because they haven't moved. I want you to learn this language, okay? If it's about moments, you want to refer to the word moment in your answer. You want to talk about whether it's clockwise or anti-clockwise, and you want to talk about the, the distance to the pivot. The next question was really tricky. Um, lots of you had a really good go at this, but you fell at the final hurdle because you forgot that mass and weight are not the same thing. A moment is a force multiplied by a perpendicular distance not a mass. So when you do your moment calculation, what you'll end up with is the weight of the backpack. And you need to remember to do the final step. First things first though, if the seesaw balances because child A puts on a backpack, it means that they're in equilibrium. 
equilibrium means that there is no resultant moment. So there's no turning effect. It's just going to balance, right? Which means that the clockwise moment, whatever's pulling to turn this way, has to equal the anti-clockwise moment. They're, they're balancing each other out. So if we look anti-clockwise, so this is child A, we have force of 450 newtons multiplied by perpendicular distance, 1.6. But now we also have the backpack to consider as well. So we have to add the force of the backpack, okay, multiplied by its perpendicular distance. And we're still going to count that as 1.6 because what we're saying is this is one object with a centre of mass acting at that 1.6 point. Okay, it acts through the child. So anti-clockwise, we have two anti-clockwise moments when the backpack is on. The child A, force times perpendicular distance, plus the backpack, weight times the perpendicular distance. Clockwise, we have child B, we have 900, but it's now the force times the perpendicular distance, it's the 0 0.85, not the um, 0 0.8 that you read on the diagram. So, you would have got one mark for recognising that if it's balanced, clockwise equals anti-clockwise. So I write everything anti-clockwise equals everything clockwise. Okay. Then it's just simplifying. So I calculate this out. I calculate this out. So 720 plus 1.6 times the weight of the backpack equals 765. So to get 1.6 times the weight of the backpack by itself, I have to minus 720 from both sides. If you got to 45 newtons, that got you one mark. So we now know the backpack has a, a moment, I should say, of 45 newton meters. Because remember, we have 1.6 is the perpendicular distance multiplied by the force. So you need to remember that that is a moment and not your final value. You know that that acted at a distance of 1.6 metres. So you know that you can find the weight, which is the force, by doing the moment divided by the perpendicular distance. So 45 divided by 1.6 got me to 28.125 newtons. So that's the weight of the backpack. So it's still not completely finished. Weight is mass times gravity. So the mass comes from the weight divided by the gravity. So I have to take that value and divide by 9.8, which gets me my final answer of 2.87 kilograms. Now in B, it says the concrete floor under the seesaw is replaced with a rubber floor. A child falls from the seesaw and experiences an impulse when they hit the floor. A, uh, sorry, I, define impulse. You just need to remember this, and a lot of you did not know this, okay? If you don't know the basic definitions, you're going to lose marks. Impulse is the change in momentum of an object, tick. For the second part, though, that is trickier. So it says, explain how the rubber floor reduces injury to the child. So use ideas about impulse, force, momentum, and time in your answer. I don't need you to write all of this. You actually only need this section, but in order to understand this, we have to start here. So we just said that impulse is change in momentum, but you should also remember by definition that it's equal to force multiplied by time. So momentum, P, is mass multiplied by velocity. The child's mass is constant. The child will hit the floor with the same velocity regardless of what the floor is made of. They're above the ground by a fixed amount and then they're falling a fixed distance. By the time they get here, they will have the same velocity. It doesn't matter what the floor is made of. Which means that when they hit the floor, whatever it's made of, the momentum, mass times velocity, will be the same doesn't matter what they hit the floor with, right? The instant they hit the floor, they have the same momentum. The floor slows them down and stops them. That's the purpose of the floor here, right? So the floor brings the child to rest regardless of what it's made of. So if it has zero velocity, it has zero momentum, 
at the end of the collision. So once they've hit the floor, they come to a stop, their momentum decreases to zero. So it doesn't matter what the floor is made of. For the child, they have a momentum when they hit the floor, they come to rest, so their change in momentum is constant. Impulse is change in momentum. We've just said that that has to be constant, whatever the floor is made of. So the force multiplied by the time is a constant. So, mark points. The impulse of the child is the same on both floors, one. The time taken for the child to come to rest is longer on the rubber floor because rubber compresses. If we know that force multiplied by time is a constant value and time increases, then force must decrease so that the product of them is constant. So the third mark comes from saying this means that the force on the child is smaller, which reduces injury. In question two, it's a continued momentum uh, section. So you've got a simple calculation. Momentum is mass multiplied by velocity, but lots of you got caught out because you forgot that you needed to convert to kilograms. So once you've done that, plug in and you get 1.3 kilogram meters per second. So you've got one for the conversion, one for the calculation. This second part is trickier, and a lot of you gave it a go, but you've got some confused ideas. So after hitting the object, the ball bounces back along the same straight path with a speed of 1.5 meters per second. The object has a mass of 1.8 kilograms. Calculate the speed of the object after it is hit by the ball. I would always sketch out before and after to help me visualize. So before I have the ball with this mass and this velocity to the right, reaching something with zero meters per second and 1.8 kilograms. Afterwards, we're told it bounces back along the same straight path. So it's literally going in and coming straight back out. It has a speed of 1.5 meters per second, but it's now moving to the left. And we know that up is positive, down is negative, to the right is positive, and to the left is negative with vectors. So if it's moving to the left, it has minus 1.5 meters per second velocity. So, a lot of you did get one mark because you stated that the total momentum of the system before has to equal the total momentum of the system afterwards. So we have to find the individual momentums and add them together before, find the total momentum by adding the individual momentums after, and solving for the unknown. So we have the momentum of the ball plus the momentum of the object is all of the momentum before. We have the momentum of the ball plus the momentum of the object after as the total momentum after. Momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. So we have the mass of the ball multiplied by its first velocity plus we have the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity. This is zero, so the only momentum in the system came from the ball. So we get to 1.311 before. Afterwards, however, the mass of the ball multiplied by the velocity of the ball is now a negative number. It has negative momentum showing it's going to the left. We don't know the value of V, but we can just use V to solve for it. The momentum of the object afterwards is 1.8, its mass multiplied by its velocity, V. So I get the sum 1.31 equals minus 0 0.285 plus 1.8 V. If I add 0 0.285 to both sides of this equation, I get 1.8 V. And then I can divide both sides by 1.8 to get my value for V, and I get my final answer. In question three, uh, a car accelerates uniformly in a straight line from rest at time t equals zero. At time 3.2 seconds, the speed is 13 meters per second. Calculate the acceleration of the car. Too many people did not remember the equation or put it in the wrong way round. Lots of you wrote this, tick, one mark, and then you still did this the wrong way round. So you're not reading carefully enough. So 
Rest means not moving. U is initial velocity, is zero. Finally, V is 13, T is 3.2. Acceleration is change in velocity over time. The change in velocity was 13 minus zero. The time was 3.2, getting my acceleration. Again, lots of you not getting this mark because you haven't bothered to uh, memorize your definitions. It, you're just wasting your opportunities to get easy marks. I've given you the definitions that you need to memorize. Please do that. So acceleration is either rate of change of velocity or you can say change in velocity per unit time. In B, the car travels at 13 meters per second from T is 3.2 to 3 is 12. Uh, seconds. Plot the speed time graph from t is 0 to t is 12. So we still need the information from up here. We know it started at rest, so we start from 0, 0. We know it accelerates uniformly, so at a constant rate, until uh, 3.2 uh, seconds, sorry. Okay, 3.2 was 3 squares away from 2 because each small square is worth 0 0.4. So by the point you get to 3.2 seconds, you need to be at 13 meters per second. And then it travels at that speed until 12 seconds. So you just needed the yellow line. In II, determine the distance traveled between T is zero and T is 3.2. Lots of you didn't read this carefully enough and you found the total area till 12 seconds. So you had the right idea, but you weren't paying enough attention to the parameters. So distance is speed times time. That's the area under the graph. So you've got one mark for recognizing that. Between 0 and 3.2 seconds, that's a triangle. So it's a half times base times height. You just read the numbers off the graph, and you end up with 20.8 meters. Last page. On another day, the car travels a longer distance while it decelerates from 13 meters per second to zero meters per second. The deceleration is constant. Suggest and explain what causes the stopping distance to increase. So their deceleration is the same, right? They go from traveling at 13 meters per second to zero meters per second. So why for a car would that take a longer distance? So we know then that the change in speed has to be the same, but the rate at which that happens has to be lower for it to then travel further. There are lots of reasons you could choose. I've only chosen one so that if you got this wrong, you can choose this in future. Okay, A wet or an icy road is a reason why it would travel further while decelerating from these two values. There would be less friction between the tires and the road if it's wet and icy. So the acceleration would be smaller, okay? Because we know that acceleration is the resultant force divided by the mass. So if the friction decreases, the acceleration decreases. So it does this change at a slower rate. In question four, you've got a lens diagram. Uh, so a page of printed text is placed 18 centimetres from a converging lens, has a focal length of 35 centimetres. Um, you've got a scale diagram. They tell you that each five small squares is worth five centimetres. Um, and they basically tell you that one centimetre on the scale, so this is one centimetre, is actually worth five centimetres, as they've shown you here as well. By drawing on figure 6.1, locate the image of the page produced by the lens and label it I. So I'm looking at how far away from the lens will the image be. You got one mark for drawing two correct rays. I've drawn these in orange and pink. So I've gone from the top of the page. Same as always, a ray that comes in parallel goes out through the focal point. A ray that goes through the center carries on. These two are diverging, so they're never going to meet down here. So we know that a virtual image will be produced because if we receive this light in our eyes, we know that the light for our brain, we will think that it has come from this point where they appear to both have come from. So the image will be at this backtracked point. So we then have an A mark for drawing that image and labeling it I. 
It then asks you to determine the actual distance, so using the scale from the lens. So you then just need to count how many squares you have uh, from your image. You can be slightly different to mine. They allowed between 35 and 40, but basically you're counting every five. So you've got five, 10, uh, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 for me, but you could have had 35 to 40. Anywhere between there would be fine. And then, uh, very frustratingly, everyone pretty much remembered that a magnifying glass produces a virtual image, so that was good. It's just your explanation wasn't quite right. So you need to memorize for me that a virtual image is where real light rays do not actually pass through the image and virtual images cannot be projected on a screen. So please, please, please just memorize that. There you go.